In 1600, the Inquisition, Spanish or otherwise, was no joking matter. At no time was that more on display than on the morning of February 17th of that year when a defrocked and excommunicated Dominican friar was led up to the top of a pile of stakes and tied to a pole. When the charges were read against him, eight articles in all, he was asked to respond, something he declined to do. When the sentence of death was pronounced, his only response was to remark, you may be more afraid to bring that sentence against me than I am to accept it. With this act of defiance, the stakes were lit, and in due time and measure, the flames consumed the body of the man who had once been a celebrity in the courts of Henry III of France and Elizabeth I of England, before returning to Rome to be betrayed by the man who had invited him there in the first place. On that site, on Rome's Campo Dia Fiori, there now stands a statue in bronze of the short monastic who invoked the wrath of the Inquisition. His stern gaze peers out from under the hood of his cowl, as if to challenge his viewer. His hands are crossed in front of him, with the left clasping the wrist of the right arm. In his right hand is a book, untitled, with his index finger marking a place, as if to show something to the viewer. Carved into the pedestal are the words, To Bruno, from the generation he foresaw, here, where the pyre burned. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 16.1, Supplemental. Counter-Reformation and the Life of Giordano Bruno. This week, I'd like to pause the scientific narrative a bit to provide a bit of context for what's to come. As we've looked at the life and the work of first Tycho Brahe and then, to a much more limited extent, Johannes Kepler, the socio-political issues that have been simmering in Europe have played only a small role. However, as we move forward into a deeper examination of Kepler's life and then that of Galileo Galilei, those issues will boil over in such a way as to profoundly affect things going forward. However, even as I undertake to discuss these topics, I would like to make a few prefatory comments. First, there's a very well-defined narrative that has grown up around this period of time that centers on a conflict between science and the Catholic tradition of the Christian faith. In my opinion, this narrative is at least flawed if not erroneous, in several places. My hope in this episode is to give a bit more of a comprehensive and nuanced perspective. Second, the goal here is to provide context, not to do an in-depth examination of the history. As such, there will be a few gaps and more than a few generalizations. As this podcast is not a political history of early modern Europe, I hope you won't expect me to discuss every figure, conflict, and resolution. The idea is to give you, my faithful listener, a sense of the currents and forces shaping the world in which the science is happening and, as importantly, being communicated. Third, I'm not a historian, nor do I play one on TV. In this, I will be sticking with the broadly accepted views held by historians and historians of science regarding the causes and effects of these kinds of events. These perspectives are not fully agreed upon, and so there is still a good bit of debate regarding them, 
especially in the specifics. This is one of the reasons I'm going to stay with the broad overview approach. Moreover, even when the events are broadly agreed upon, the interpretation of the causes and consequences of those events are often the subject of some pretty intense academic discourse. In other words, I know here that I can't please all of the people all of the time on this sort of a thing, but I hope that I can do a fair enough job that you'll be able to understand the forces shaping the culture in which Kepler and Galileo did their work. For those of you who are well versed in the political and social history of this period of time, everything I say here will probably be old hat, as the saying goes. No new ground will be broken, nor will there be any earth-shattering revelations, at least I don't think there will be. For those who are only passingly familiar with things like the Counter-Reformation, the Peace of Augsburg, the Thirty Years' War, and the Inquis Inquisition, my hope is that this will help you put those elements of our story in their proper places. Finally, as such discussions can become somewhat esoteric, or at least removed from our direct experience, it is useful to tell the stories of a few of the people who were directly affected by these forces. Hence, we will look at the narratives and lives of Giordano Bruno, someone many of you may have at least heard of, and more broadly, the German witch trials, something certainly for most people is less well known about. Through these stories, I hope we'll be able to come and see what these forces were that were shaping Europe and what they did in the narratives that we're discussing. So where to start? Probably the best place is at the church in Wittenberg and Martin Luther's 95 Theses nailed to the door there in 1517. The Protestant Reformation was the result of a variety of complaints and abuses that had built up over the years. Luther hadn't been the first to complain about these things, and prior to his decision to make such a public statement of frustration, other elements within the Catholic Church itself had tried to examine and implement reforms. Some of these had been in the monastic orders of the Church, as evidenced by the work of St. Francis of Assisi and others. Another movement was in response to the growing secularity and worldliness of the papacy, most notably in the pontificates of Alexander VI, and Leo XI, whose support of humanism in the sciences and the arts was accompanied by ostentatious displays of material wealth and brutal executions of political influence and power. Critics within the church, alarmed at the worldly direction the church had taken, called for a number of reforms, including changes in governing structure, restrictions on wealth, and the elimination of the selling of offices and indulgences. While a few of these reforms were received and implemented, the majority of the most fundamental were either rejected or ignored. This was what prompted Luther to take the bold step that he did. What was even more surprising, though, was that he found that there were others who were willing to stake their political futures on backing his ideas. To understand this, we need to take a look at Central and Northern Europe and what we call today Germany, Austria, and the region known as the Low Countries. In the 14th and 15th centuries, this portion of Europe was broken into dozens, I think the number I saw actually was something like 221, different political entities ranging from free cities and small ecclesial states to larger duchies, principalities, and even a few kingdoms. The political structure near the Baltic that we discussed in our episodes on Copernicus is an excellent example of this kind of a hodgepodge political landscape that was emerging from feudalism and moving towards something looking more like the modern nation states that would arise in England and France at about this time. Much of this reason, outside of Poland, was part of what was known as something called the Holy Roman Empire. This was a large collection of those political entities who had sort of banded together in a pseudo-federal system of mutual cooperation and defense where the most powerful rulers of the region gathered when necessary to elect one of their own to the position known as Holy Roman Emperor. Not surprisingly, this collection was always an unstable one with different rulers jockeying for position and advantage. But in time, a branch of the Habsburg family, specifically controlling the regions of Austria and Hungary, Bo Bohemia and some other places, had managed to exert enough influence to become the de facto ruling family of this Holy Roman Empire. 
Not everyone was particularly happy with this, nor were they thrilled about the ever-increasing demands the Catholic Church was placing on them. And this dissatisfaction was not just an upper echelon only sort of thing either. The people of Germany were tired of sending their tithes to a distant pope who built elaborate edifices to his and his family's name while staffing their parish churches with poor and often only marginally literate clergy. In 1500, during the jubilee of that year, Italy may have been riding high, but much of that had been built on the backs of the people north of the Alps. So, when Luther attacks the worst of the abuses of a worldly church, he finds a whole lot of people willing to listen to his ideas. More importantly, though, he finds some of these political figures who are willing to shelter him from the reprisal of the church's most notorious instrument for enforcing doctrinal purity, the Inquisition. Before we go any further, let's take a moment to look at that. Contrary to many portrayals, the Inquisition did not begin during the Renaissance, nor was it confined to Spain in her colonial holdings. The institution of the Inquisition went back as far as the 1100s, where it had been created to combat specific heresies arising in Europe at that time. It was a system of courts and tribunals, separate from a given nation's or political entity's secular judicial system, that had the purpose of determining whether or not an individual or group not only held beliefs that were contrary to the teachings of the church, but then also worked to spread those ideas and beliefs to others after being warned against doing so by either the local clergy or ecclesial authority. These courts and tribunals served the sole function of determining whether heretical beliefs and teachings existed. If so, the inquisitionary body could recommend certain religious penalties, such as the performance of a penance or ex excommunication, or if it was thought that a civil action could be taken, the inquisition office could then turn the offender over to the local authorities for additional punishment of a civil nature. Given this, there are two things that should be noted, at least as far as I can tell. The first is that the Inquisition never actually executed people by any means, including burning them at the stakes. These sorts of things were done by the civil authorities who determined that such punishments were appropriate given the circumstances. Anyone who has studied this period of European history knows that the use of violence as a means of social control was frequent and brutal. I think that's beyond question that human life did not hold anywhere near the value it does now in the minds of most Europeans in the 13th through 17th centuries. However, that point being made, it must also be noted that when the Inquisition did turn people over to the civil authorities to be sentenced, it did so with a pretty good understanding of what the outcome would be. In a way, it was a bit like Pontius Pilate in the Christian Passion narrative, where in this case, the church could wash its hands of the blood of those it pronounced heretics all it wanted, but the stain still remained. Second, for many in a time when worldly punishment was frequent and brutal, the religious penalties were often seen as a greater consequence for heretical action, as excommunication was thought to cut a person off from the eternal life of respite from worldly suffering and turmoil. It may be hard for us to imagine now, but in a world often characterized by strife, drunkenness, and violence, not to mention the effects of disease and famine, the idea of transitioning to an existence where those things were thought to be absence was a profoundly alluring one. The ability to deny a person access to that escape, or, conversely, to guarantee it, was a powerful tool in shaping behavior. As such, most people investigated by the Inquisition never had to be turned over to the civil authorities for harsher punishment. The threat of eternal damnation, often so vividly on display in the events taking place around a person, was usually enough to get someone on the wrong side of the church to reconsider their ideas. So, to bring us back to the time of the Protestant Reformation, those who questioned the course of the church and its leaders did so very cautiously for the most part. Only in the cases of monastic reform movements did such criticism seem to have a whole lot of success, likely because it could be contained to a small number of religiously committed individuals, and thus it sort of formed a, a pilot project as it were, and then 
If that were successful, it could be rolled out to the broader church if practical and beneficial. Those individuals who are more strident in their calls for reform or more critical of the leadership of the church could be handled through the Inquisition and then the civil justice system. If they were unwilling to moderate their criticisms, they were often dealt with fairly harshly, often with fatal results, as was the case with a few men who preceded Luther in calling for large and systemic reforms to the church. What made Luther successful was that some of the German princes of the Holy Roman Empire had had enough of the increasingly secular and political popes in Rome calling the shots, and also, through a variety of means, extorting vast sums of money from them to continue in expanding the pope's influence and dominance. Luther offered another way forward that did not require subservience to Rome, or even, at times, the Holy Roman Emperor. Over the course of the next 35 or so years, there would be an ongoing struggle between various factions in the empire as to how this was to all play out. We won't dwell on this much other than to say two things. First, as my colleague, the historian Gary Cox, has pointed out, a lot of what happens is as much about politics here as it is about religion. The popes had begun the trend of conflating religious and political influence, and when the Reformation begins, nearly every ruler in the Holy Roman Empire will follow that trend at some level or another. While there were certainly true believers among the various princes, electors, dukes, bishops, or whatever, it is certainly accurate to say that much of the stripe had as much to do with achieving political ends as it did religious ones. Second, the struggle wasn't something that only happened at the highest level of society. One of the earliest and most notable sources of conflict was a peasant uprising that nearly toppled a number of political entities. This served notice throughout much of the period that the religious practices and political demands of the people were ignored only at some risk, sometimes some great risk, to the aristocracy of the time. The early period of strife was brought to a close in 1555 by what is known as the Peace of Augsburg. Now the peace is really an interesting document for a lot of different reasons, but here's the key things. The peace said that whatever perspective of faith a ruler had, his lands would be governed under that faith tradition. So. If a prince confessed as a Lutheran, his lands were Lutheran. If he spoke the Nicene Creed each Sunday morning, he and his lands were Catholic. A couple of points are to be made here. First, the peace has the effect of permanently legitimizing the Reformation and the teachings of Luther and his followers. The church might say that Lutherans are heretics and condemned to eternal perdition, but they couldn't say that they had no right to exist. Second, the peace was a document that was too little, too late. By the time that it's signed, Calvin and his followers are set up in Geneva and Protestantism itself has begun to fracture. More than a little conflict will arise from this as will be seen in the life of Kepler, who because of his refusal to see Calvinists as anything other than brothers in Christ, even as he disagreed with their theology, would lead to him being excommunicated from the Lutheran fellowship and spend much of his life without a church home. Finally, and most importantly, the peace made it clear to the Catholic Church that it would no longer be able to just assume that the Reformation would go away because it was, at least in their eyes, wrong. The questions and objections it raised about the theology and practice of the Catholic Church had to be addressed. This would be done at the Council of Trent, a nearly 20-year affair between 1545 and 1563, which can be seen as the first part of what would become known as the Counter-Reformation. The Council of Trent undertook a thorough re-examination of the Catholic faith, in part to see if there were areas where common ground could be found with the Protestants. One of the things a lot of folks don't know is that in the early sessions of the Council of Trent, Protestant leaders were invited as observers to contribute to the discussions. This is consistent with the efforts that there had already been to attempt to reunite Christendom in the West, which had consistently run aground on the rocks of doctrinal differences and secular interference, i.e., not all of Germany was excited by the prospect of once again having the Italian pontiff have a say in German affairs. 
the council examined and affirmed all of the core tenets of Catholic theology, but recognized that there had been abuses in the implementation and practice of the faith. It affirmed the Church's support of humanism as well as continued support for the arts and sciences, but did so within a framework of the now nearly 350-year-old paradigm of Thomistic Aristotelianism. As before, the three pillars of knowledge, Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas, were affirmed as the foundation of all learning as well as for understanding the natural universe. This meant the stationary earth. It meant motions of the heavens based on turning spheres. It meant that there were two realms of nature, the terrestrial and the celestial, and five elements, earth, water, air, fire, and ether, all distributed continuously with no void. One of the most prominent outcomes of the council also was to tighten up the theological adherence to the doctrinal positions of the Catholic Church and restrain the worst abuses of the secular popes and what they had allowed. Among the foremost agencies in this was the newly founded Society of Jesus or Jesuit Order, who would undertake the task of educating those in Catholic controlled areas. Perhaps the most important figure in this, this whole education effort, at least as will relate to our story, will be a member of that Austrian Habsburg family, a man by the name of Ferdinand. Now, before we talk about Ferdinand and the havoc he will cause, let's say a few words about how things really tended to work after the Peace of Augsburg. While a map at any given time might show a sort of checkerboard patchwork of Protestant and Catholic provinces that switched from time to time depending on who the ruler was and what they believed and confessed, things were often a lot more granular at the ground level. While nothing approaching freedom of religion existed, a wise or at least pragmatic ruler understood that if a sizable port of, portion of the population under his authority was of the other faith tradition, there was a, a practical value in adopting a live and let live approach to things. This had been the situation in Graz when Kepler arrived in 1595. The ruler was a Catholic, but there was a sizable Protestant population, so while the Catholics were certainly given preferential treatment, the Lutherans were allowed to build and have churches of their own, and even a school to teach their children in, which is, of course, why Kepler had been hired there. The problem is that as tolerant as this all seems, not infrequently, when one group of citizens got the upper hand on the other, they would perpetuate acts of disrespect towards the other something that would create and deepen divides over the time. Protestants vulgarly mocked the Catholic veneration of saints, including Mary, while Catholics closed churches and schools and forced cross-tradition baptisms on the children of Protestants as just a couple of examples of this sort of thing. Moreover, as the teachings of the Counter-Reformation began to take hold in the ruling class, those individuals became less tolerant and as anyone who has studied history knows, one of the best ways to create civil unrest is to take back rights and protections that people think have already been granted. In some places, such as Styria with Ferdinand, things go off without much serious resistance, while in others, such as Prague's, things don't go nearly so well. This is how we get to the Thirty Years' War. As we discussed, Ethnic Germany is ruled as something of a confederation with the Habsburg family of Austria as the de facto ruling family at this point. While not technically hereditary, the title of Holy Roman Emperor now rested with the Habsburgs, with Rudolf II holding the position when first Tycho and then Kepler were named as imperial mathematicians. Rudolf, however, was not a particularly well-balanced individual, and in time, and through a bunch of machinations, lost the title to his brother Matthias, who being childless, named the staunchly Catholic Ferdinand as his heir. The Protestants in the region, both in the ruling nobility and in the middle class, felt this to be inappropriate as the position of Holy Roman Emperor was technically something someone was elected to, as opposed to a title that could just be named or passed on within a family. This led to increasing tensions and the forming up of different factions within the Holy Roman Emperor, Empire, some being Catholic, some being Protestant, Lutheran, and some actually being Protestant Calvinist. 
The flashpoint for all of this was reached in 1618 when the Protestants of Prague seized control of the city and then threw emissaries of Ferdinand out an upper story window of Prague Castle. This is known as the rather famous defenestration of Prague. This kicks off the Thirty Years' War, which begins as a religious war within the Holy Roman Empire, but eventually becomes a European-wide conflict that would be the continent's most violent and destructive war until the Napoleonic Wars some two centuries later. While the details of this conflict are far too convoluted to go into here, it can be said that after a number of initial successes, the forces of Ferdinand were eventually stopped and the tides were turned against him. These setbacks would have a number of ripple effects, eventually reaching all the way to Rome itself. Throughout the period of the Counter-Reformation and into the Thirty Years' War, the tolerance of dissent, both theological and political, varied. But what seems to have been the case is that when dissent crossed a certain line, the consequences could be really severe. What the line more often than not seems to have been was the blatant disregard for authority. You could hold all sorts of divergent ideas about things outside the core theological issues, and that would be all well and good. However, if you were told to stop promoting a set of views or teachings and you didn't, well, things could go south for you pretty quickly. Such was the case for Giordano Bruno and later Galileo Galilei. Giordano Bruno was born in 1548, just two years after Tycho Brahe, in the Italian town of Nola at the base of Mount Vesuvius. He was an astonishingly bright son of a soldier who was soon taken into the illustrious Dominican convent of San Domenico Maggiore in Naples. He excelled in theology and philosophy, but was prone to asking questions that attacked the orthodox views of his time. He read everything he could get his hands on and engaged others in conversations that made it very clear that he had no intention of accepting the party line on anything, no matter how long it had been held. At the age of 28, after 11 years at the convent, he was forced to flee in the dark of the night to avoid interrogation by the Inquisition, throwing the book he had been reading, written by the Protestant humanist Erasmus Reinhold, down a well as part of getting away. On the run, he moved from court to court, at first charming and then infuriating his hosts with the scope of his learning and the inflexibility of his iconoclastic views on nearly everything. At one point in this five-year journey, he even tutored the young Henry III of France and may have served as a spy for Queen Elizabeth I, though this latter supposition is broadly disputed. He devised a highly effective memory system that can still be used by some today and wrote and published on a stunning array of topics. He made enemies as quickly as he did friends and he suffered no fool lightly. He traveled around Europe, taught at universities, and corresponded with reformers and emperors alike. In 1591, he was invited to Venice by a nobleman who promised to support his work and shield him from the Inquisition a promise the guy might have even intended to keep, at least until the Inquisitors came knocking on his door with a papal bull and a threat of excommunication discreetly tucked under their arms. Bruno had contacted a local friar with the intention of finding a way to get his writings, all of them heretical, to the Pope. The friar had contacted the appropriate authorities, and the rest, as they say, is history. Except, except that the history is notoriously difficult to unravel in this case. The trials and imprisonments would go on for eight long years, suggesting that the church did not wish to make a martyr of this man so well known across all of Europe. The records of the trials have been lost, probably when the forces of Napoleon sacked the Vatican Library and moved some of the records there to Paris. What we know is that in the end, there were eight charges brought against him that he was eventually found guilty of. Now, 
if this were the whole of the story, one could be forgiven for wondering why we're talking about him now. The thing is, it's not the whole of the story. In the intervening years, there was a continuation of this narrative that grew up. The narrative was that one of the charges brought against Bruno was that he was a Copernican. And, as a Copernican, he held the heretical belief that the universe was infinitely large, that the sun, stars were other suns, and around those suns were worlds inhabited by beings like us. And in time, the story sort of changes even more to say that not only was this just a charge, it was the main charge for which he was tried as a heretic, and that in his death, Giordano Bruno becomes the first martyr in the growing schism between science and religion. And it's a compelling narrative, with the villain being the chief inquisitor, a Jesuit cardinal by the name of Robert Bellarmine, who we'll meet again, and the long-suffering and scientifically correct Bruno as the brave hero bound for death, a bit like Mel Gibson's William Wallace in Braveheart. One almost expects, in the movie, for you know, Bruno to have, when offered one last chance to look at the crucifix and recant of his heresy as the flames lapped at his flesh, to have lifted his eyes instead to heaven and screamed, Knowledge! Actually, instead, according to the reports of the event, he is said to have just looked away from the holy relic, thus seeming to reject what it might have had to have offered. The problem here is that this narrative is just, it's just wrong. In 1600, holding a Copernican worldview was not heretical. Copernicanism wouldn't be outlawed for another 16 years. Beyond that, it isn't exactly clear what it was that Bruno actually believed. His writings are vague and contradictory at many points, but it does seem that in addition to the idea that the earth moved, Bruno may have denied the divinity of Christ, the doctrine of the Trinity, and the virginity of Mary. Add to that a belief in atomism and a possible rejection of the theological position of transubstantiation, and you've got a guy who is at odds with just about every important dogma held by the church he professed to be trying to save. While Bruno may have been a martyr, he was not killed for his scientific views. Let's just get that out of the way right now. Rather, he stands as an example of what happened to those who continued to defy the authority of the Catholic Church in matters of doctrine. Also, he stands as a person whose bravery in defending his beliefs, no matter how outlandish they may have been or how offensive they may have been presented, that bravery that he has can be inspiring to others. To be honest, his willingness to stand up to the apparatus of the church and its inquisition reminds one of no one so much as Socrates in that man's willingness to defy the Council of Athens some 2,000 years earlier. There's this common thread to many who hold conspiracy theories and other unorthodox ideas, and that is to claim an identification with Bruno's fellow Italian Galileo as someone who stood up to an incorrect and perhaps oppressive system and was persecuted for it. What I think would be substantially more correct would be for those people, for a whole lot of reasons, to claim kinship with Giordano Bruno instead. To conclude this episode, I would like to take a brief look at another group who suffered immeasurably as a result of the heightening religious tensions of the period. All across Europe, but in Germany in particular, literally thousands of women were put on trial and condemned and executed as witches. This phenomenon is a complex one, perhaps even more so than the political events of the time, if that can be believed. During the period leading up to the 17th century, it was recognized that while witchcraft did exist, it could be divided into white and black magic, 
corresponding to versions that seem to help people and versions that seem to hurt them. Often, this was tied up in the practice of astrology, alchemy, and other semi-scientific enterprises such as herbal medicine or practical medicine, and even metallurgy. During this period, however, the practice of any sort of magic, if said magic was thought to undermine the authority of God, was increasingly outlawed and prosecuted. These prosecutions often fell upon the weakest and most marginal members of society, women. Women often who had practiced making things like herbal medicines and mostly harmless love potions. Nevertheless, in order to terrorize a potentially unruly population, local magistrates would seize upon the flimsiest of charges against those least able to defend themselves and then prosecute, frequently outside the traditional channels of church jurisdiction. While numbers are difficult to pin down, the most common number of killings I found seems to be around 50,000 women killed in the years between 1500 and 1700. But there are those historians who place the total well above 200,000 during that same period of time. In Central and Northern Europe, the peak period of this activity was between 1561 and 1670. Perhaps the first and most notorious of these was the Weinsteig witch trial of 1562, where the count of the city had over 60 women put to death after a severe hailstorm ravaged the town. This was all it took. Bad hailstorm, and you get to kill some 60-odd women who likely are guilty of little more than asking pesky questions and challenging the authority of the count and those who worked for him, especially if he may have been corrupt. Most of the time, however, the numbers of trials at any one time were just never quite this big. Instead, what you had was women in small towns being killed at a rate of one or two every couple of years all over Central and Northern Europe. But for the position of her son, Katharina Kepler would have been one of those consigned to be a statistic in this horrible, horrible attrition of individuals. We'll look at her story in a later episode to give a sense of what factors and forces led to the accusations against her and the subsequent trial and prosecution. It's really stunningly chilling how little evidence was required to kill a person. As we bring this episode to a close, I hope that you've gained a bit of perspective on what's taking place outside that limited world of scientific inquiry during the years following the Protestant Reformation. As we delve into the lives of Johannes Kepler and Galileo Galilei, these events will intrude even more acutely into their lives than what we've already seen. In our next episode, we'll look at the scientific work of Galileo before and where we turn to a series of biographical episodes. I say next time because this coming week is midterms at my paying gig at Gordon State College, and so I expect that I'll need to grade about 100 exams between now and a week from now, and that whole process is probably going to cut quite a bit into my research and writing time. While I may be able to get an episode out on the normally scheduled Sunday schedule, don't be surprised if there's a delay. On a more positive note, remember that we're rapidly approaching our 100th episode, and I'll be answering any number of questions from you, the crew of the Odyssey. Be sure to send them my way by commenting at our website, thescientificodyssey.typepad.com, emailing me at cldavies at mac.com, shooting me a personal message on Twitter, at Chad Davies is my handle, or by stopping by our Facebook page and leaving a note there. Also, kind of an interesting thing's come up for me. As part of Gordon State's History Club's semester activities, I've been asked to be a part of a three-person debate as to who the most influential person in history was. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that question. 
I have an idea of who I'm going to go with, but I'd love to know what you think. We'll have a thread devoted to it on our Facebook page. And so go out there and, and give me your opinion. Support your idea. Let me see what you think was the most important person in the history of history. I'll let you know who I've chosen on the 100th episode. If I decide, decide to stay with that person, then, you know, I'll let you know that as well. But I can give you a hint. The person is someone that we have talked about, though it's been a while now, in this season of the Scientific Odyssey. So there you have it. If you have a minute, leave us a review. And if you're so inclined, please send positive thoughts, delicious pastries, and fine beverages my way as I hunker down to grade my students' work to see if they've mastered physics, problem solving, and critical thinking. For those who have done this, you know that assessment can be a simultaneously exhilarating and demoralizing experience. Let's hope that we all get through it with our sanity intact. So until next time, full sails on your journey.